Okay, looks like we're recording now. Excellent. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Alice. I work with CDPS and Human Resources and so grateful that you all can join us. So as you know, we've been talking about how at CDPS we are really going to focus on accessibility this year. So we're kicking that off with just an introduction and an overview with Tess Stanton. She's here from the Rocky Mountain ADA Center. And today we're gonna just learn some of the basics, like the prevalence of disability and why equity matters. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we're gonna learn um, just kind of like what our responsibilities are as a state government entity. So a little bit about Tess. Um, she is the training administrator for the Rocky Mountain ADA Center. So she just, she works on in-person facilitation. Um, she obviously will join us remotely and she covers a whole huge region. She can tell you about that. Um, so Tess helps develop some, some customized and comprehensive training programs, which is really cool. And then she can guide us through the ADA. So um, kind of the standards and AD in the workplace and our responsibilities. Uh, and then also we're going to be talking about more coming up in September and October. So I hope that you all can join us on September 20th. Sorry, Tess will be here again to talk about disability etiquette. So I know I'm looking forward to that one. And then on October 18th, we have Tess and Emily, I think is joining her. Uh, let's see, when is that one? The October, is it the 20th? 18th. Oh, the 18th, sorry, that's right. Yeah, September 20th. <laughs> October 18th, uh, we also have effective communication in the ADA. So looking forward to all of those coming up soon. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Tess and let you get us started. So thank you, Tess. Awesome, thank you so much for that awesome introduction. Um, okay, so can you still see my screen? We, let's see, I see you. Do other folks okay. see Tessa's screen? Not yet. No. Okay, let's try this again then. Okay, how goes. about now? Got it. Now we're Perfect. looking good. Awesome, and it's still full screen, no presenter notes or anything? Yes, it looks good. Okay, awesome. Well, I will go ahead and jump in. Thank you so much again, Alice, for that introduction. That was amazing, and I'm so happy to be here with everyone talking about disability awareness and give you kind of an overview of the ADA, what it says, what it stands for, why we have it. And like um, Alice said, my name is Tess Stanton. I'm the training administrator here at the Rocky Mountain ADA Center. We operate out of Colorado Springs, but we cover a whole multitude of states, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So before we dive into the content, um, I just wanted to give a quick disclaimer that we always like to give at the beginning of our presentations, that we are not lawyers here at the ADA Center. We are not giving any legal advice. We are an educational agency here to provide information and informal guidance on the Americans with Disabilities Act. We're funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, and we're here to provide information, low-cost training, and free technical assistance to, to anyone who's wanting to know more about the Americans with Disabilities Act, and we really want to foster that voluntary compliance rather than enforce the ADA. So that's what we're all about, and I just wanted to give that quick, quick disclaimer before I dive into our content for today. So. A little bit more about the Rocky Mountain ADA Center. We are part of the Rocky Mountain, or I'm sorry, we're part of the ADA National Network. So the Rocky Mountain ADA Center is just one center in the ADA National Network. And we're one of 10 centers actually across the country. And the Rocky Mountain Center operates out of Colorado Springs, like I mentioned, and we serve six states. So we serve Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana. So we're all throughout those Rocky Mountains. And like I said, our mission is to provide information on the ADA. And our center is available to both individuals and entire entities like yourselves who are 
seeking to understand their rights and responsibilities under the ADA. So if you ever want to reach our center for technical assistance, you can just call that number on the screen. That's 1-800-949-4232. That's actually the number for the entire Rocky or for the entire ADA national network. And if you call that number, depending on your area code, you'll be routed to your appropriate center. So I'm sure for many of you, that would be the Rocky Mountain ADA Center. Or you could go on to the National Network website. That's www.adata.org. And then you can find our center website that way. And that way you could um, submit a request for technical assistance digitally, digitally or for training. And so a little bit more about the services we provide here at the Rocky Mountain ADA Center. I mentioned we offer technical assistance. That's a really big part of what we do. And what that is is us helping interpret the ADA for government officials, employers, small businesses, individuals, et cetera. So if you're looking through the ADA or you have a situation arise that you're not really sure how the ADA applies, you can get in touch with us and we'll help you interpret how the ADA applies to certain situations. We also network. So like I said, we're not an enforcement agency, but we do have access to entities within the ADA, like the Department of Justice and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commissions, those entities that do enforce the ADA. So if you needed to get in touch with them, we could refer you. We also conduct research. So part of our grant funding actually requires that we conduct research on disability topics and topics related to the ADA. So for instance, we've been diving into how implicit bias affects people with disabilities. We also provide training, which is exactly what's happening right now. We try to keep our training as low cost as possible to teach people about the ADA. And we train on topics from service animals to disability etiquette to the government's responsibilities under the ADA. And what's really cool about this training is that it is a series, so you'll get a lot of that information that we provide throughout these three trainings. We publish information, so we have a variety of online trainings. We also have a blog, which there's multiple posts on that blog monthly, so you can kind of see how the ADA applies to people's real lives. And we also um, have a social media presence. So we're on most of the major social media platforms, including TikTok, which is our latest endeavor. So if you want to learn more and just get little tidbits of information daily and see what's up with the Rocky Mountain ADA Center, you can follow us. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, like I said, TikTok. We're on Pinterest, LinkedIn. So those major social media platforms, you can keep up with us on there. And something I did want to mention is that we are operated by meeting the challenge. Um, they're actually our parent company, and they're an accessibility consulting firm. So they help Title II and three organizations, which I'll explain a little bit more about what that means, that Title II and Title III a little bit later, but they help those organizations create self-evaluation and transition plans. They can perform facility audits, architectural plan reviews, policy and procedure reviews, non-discrimination training, and more. So like I said, where the Rocky Mountain ADA Center provides that information, meeting the challenge can actually consult with you to help you foster that compliance and become ADA compliant should you be interested in that. And they don't just come around with their measuring stick and tell you that everything's wrong in your organization. They actually create a plan um, ordered by priorities given by the Department of Justice to help you implement those changes. So if you are looking to actually implement some change per the ADA, meeting the challenge is the organization you would want to contact. So now let's go ahead and jump into our training for today. So here's our training calendar. Um, today we're going to be talking about disability awareness and I'm going to give you an overview of the ADA and then like Alice mentioned our next training will be on September 20th that'll be covering disability etiquette it'll be a little bit longer than this training today and then finally we have a training on October 18th where my director Emily will cover effective communication so lots of the information that I cover today will complement the information and subsequent training is and vice versa. So if you're able to make all of them, that's great. If you're able to make any of them, that's great. All the information, like I said, complements each other and, and 
um, could also stand alone. You know, any information on the ADA is good information. So that's kind of our training calendar if you wanted to go ahead and mark those days down. So now looking at more specifically what we'll be going over today, we're going to discuss the prevalence of disability and why equity and access matter. We're going to understand the basics of the Americans with Disabilities Act and its definition of disability. We're also going to overview the five titles of the ADA, particularly titles one and two, as those might be most applicable to you and your work. And as we're moving through this, um, I want to make sure that I'm helping you meet your personal objectives as well. So if you ever have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and chime in. You could also put questions in the chat. I'm not able to monitor the chat from my view, but um, I'll definitely look at those questions at the end of our training session today. Or um, Alice, if you wanted to chime in and say, hey, we have something in the chat, that's totally fine. Feel free to unmute yourself. And like I mentioned earlier, if, if any technical difficulties go awry, if you're not able to hear me or anything like that, um, just let me know. And then another important thing I should mention is that I will send out these slides after the fact so that you can look back on them. I know that this can get kind of heavy when we're talking about different laws and entities and titles and regulations. So I do want to make sure that you have something to reference back to. So these slides will be sent out. So no need to um, you know, take really in-depth notes because you'll have all this information at your fingertips. So now let's move into a little bit of disability background and explore the prevalence of disability in America. This kind of lays a foundation of why the ADA is so important. 20 to 25 percent of people in America have disabilities. So that's approximately 60 million Americans, or you could think of that as one in four people in America. Most disabilities aren't immediately obvious. So for example, you wouldn't typically know right off the bat that someone has a learning disability. And so because of that, you can expect to interact with someone who has a disability on a daily basis, whether that be a coworker, a family member, a customer, someone you're serving. And you may not even know it immediately that they have a disability, but disability is so prevalent that you could interact with someone with a disability and not even know it, like I said. And the physical and mental limitations we experience as we age are often considered disabilities. So you may be living with a disability currently, and if you're not right now, there's a good chance that you could have a disability down the line um, if we all are so you know, lucky to age. And the primary obstacle to full participation that's facing people with disabilities is actually an inaccessible world. So there's two ways you could look at disabilities. The first is by thinking about disability as an inherent limitation, or you could look at disability as the environments around people with disabilities are actually those limitations. So it's not an inherent limitation, but rather an environmental limitation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. And disability knowledge and etiquette is actually a major form of barrier removal. So when I think of barrier removal in terms of disability, I often think of, you know, moving a chair out of an accessible route so that someone can travel through easily, but actually learning more about the prevalence of disability, learning more about disability etiquette and how to most respect and most effectively communicate with people with disabilities is actually a huge form of barrier removal for people with disabilities because sometimes the biggest barriers that people with disabilities face are other people's attitudes. So just know that by being here today and being at our subsequent trainings that we're offering, you are engaging in barrier removal for people with disabilities. So I thank you for your participation and attendance today. Hey Tess, we have a yeah, question. Absolutely. Is this focused mainly on learning or mental disabilities or uh, what else? Yeah, so this training specifically? Yes, I believe so. 
So this training specifically is very broad. It'll kind of cover the whole gamut of disability. It's really just focused on disability in general. Um, we will get into more specific disabilities when we get to our disability etiquette training. So for instance, we'll look at etiquette for people who are blind, etiquette for people who are deaf and hard of hearing, um, etiquette for people who have cognitive or intellectual disabilities. But I would say this training is really focused on disability in general, so the whole umbrella. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, that's a great question. So to talk a little bit more about that um, concept that the environment around us can create those limitations. Historically, there have been several ways that people have looked at disability and viewed disability. So there are these models of disability. So the religious model of disability, um, also sometimes called the moral model of disability, is the oldest model of disability. And it's found in a number of religious traditions. And the religious model of disability is a pre-modern paradigm that views disability as an act of God, usually a punishment for some sin committed by the disabled individual or their family. So in that sense, disability is punitive or tragic in nature. And this model frames disability as something to be ashamed of. And it insinuates that disabled people or their families are guilty of some unknown action that caused their impairment. But that mentality can serve to stigmatize disability, um, as can the medical model in a sense. So this model of disability describes disability as a consequence of a health condition, disease, or caused by a trauma that can disrupt the functioning of a person in a physiological or cognitive way. So th this model is a conceptualization of disability as a condition of a person, and it focuses on prevention and treatment and curing um, a disability. And so in the medical model, medical care is viewed as the main issue. And at the political level, the principal response is that of modifying or reforming healthcare policy. So in other words, the medical model of disability focuses on treatment of disability, which can be very useful um, and, and very, very important, but it's a little bit different than the social model of disability, which is really the model that the ADA most closely aligns with. And so this model focuses on barriers facing people with disabilities instead of concentrating on people's impairments who might have a disability. So in this model, a person's activities are limited not by the impairments or the conditions that they hold, but by the environments and barriers that are consequences to things that social organizations may lack. So in this model, disability is not an attribute of an individual, but rather it's a complex collection of conditions, many of which are created by the social environment. So this model, like I said, reflects the ADA most closely because it's all about creating a more accessible world for people with disabilities rather than focusing on how people with disabilities should change to adapt to a world that is inaccessible. Does anyone have any questions on that? Okay, awesome. I know sometimes the tables and the different definitions and models can be kind of make your head spin a little bit. So I always like to pause there. So now moving in to some Colorado disability facts. I wanted to give kind of more of a zoomed in lens of the prevalence of disability on a local level. So when we're looking at Colorado, 584,000 plus people have disabilities, which equates to about 11% of the population. To break those numbers down a little bit further, there are about 227,000 plus people with cognitive or learning disabilities, about 285,000 plus people with physical disabilities, 107,000 plus people with visual disabilities, and 192,000 plus people with hearing disabilities. That's a lot of people. So like I said, it's likely you know someone with a disability, you're very close to them, you work with someone, you may be someone with a disability. And you'll notice that these numbers, those breakdowns, the cognitive, nobility, vision, auditory, that those equate to a lot more than 584,000 plus. There is a reason for that. It's actually because many people have multiple disabilities. So that's why you see those breakdown of numbers equating to uh, much more than that larger number. <laughs> 
All right. So what is the ADA exactly? Now let's jump into what the ADA is, what it says, and I'll give a little more information on how the definition of disability is broken down per the ADA. Oh, Tess, we had a question. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, let me pause this really quickly. Yes, what's the question? Uh, what data source monitors disability in our state and across the U.S.? It was hard to read the data source notes at the bottom of the slide there. Yeah, yeah, let me go ahead and jump back to that. So um, these numbers are actually from the American Community Survey, which is um, distributed from the ADA Participation Action Research Consortium, and uh, that's also called ADA PARC. Um, and depending on what resources you're looking at, those numbers may be a little different across the board just because different surveys are conducted. You know, you may get a different number from the U.S. Census, but we get our numbers from um, ADA Park through the American Community Survey. All right, thank you. Yeah, of course. And the, the little video, we might have to make adjustments to see if we can hear it. I didn't hear anything yet when it started. I don't know if the audio was coming through yet. Okay, that's totally fine. Um, we'll just skip through that video. And if you wanna watch it, you can access it on um, our YouTube channel, but all the information in the video I'll cover on subsequent slides. So no worries there. Okay, phew. Yeah, thanks for letting me know. <laughs> All right. So um, any more questions before we kind of jump into what the Americans with Disability Act says? All right. So before the ADA, for much of American history, people with disabilities were discriminated against, unfortunately. So there was a time in America where people were not allowed employment opportunities, where no laws prohibited discrimination, where businesses, restaurants, and city streets were off limits to some people. And there were also times when people couldn't access public transportation and when communication was only tailored to a select group of people. Some people with disabilities were also hidden and excluded. So in 1927, there was a case, Carrie Buck versus Dr. James Bell. And in that case, the Supreme Court declared that the forced sterilization of people with disabilities is actually not a violation of their constitutional rights. And that they cited that was for the protection and health of the state. And so by the 1970s, over 60,000 people with disabilities were actually sterilized without consent. There were also what are known as ugly laws in the United States, and those made it illegal for any person who is diseased, maimed, mutilated, or deformed in any way so as to be an unsightly or disgusting object to expose themselves in public view. And those ugly laws actually were not repealed until 1974. So the ADA signified the adoption of a public policy committed to the removal of a broad range of impediments to the integration of people with disabilities and society and historically societies have frequently misconstrued or overreacted to or even ignored disabilities and in individual and mental physical abilities and um, there are recorded instances actually in america of ridicule torture imprisonment and execution of people with disabilities that go beyond these two examples but then in 1990, President George H.W. Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act, or we also frequently call it the ADA, into law. And the ADA is a civil rights law that affirms the inherent dignity of every American regardless of their disability. And this sweeping legislation prohibits discrimination by local and state governments. It provides standards for privately owned businesses and commercial facilities. It prohibits discrimination in the workplace, and it ensures equal access to all areas of public life. So as a civil rights law, this is a legal guarantee for all citizens, regardless of other identities or circumstances. So the ADA, you know, it, it doesn't take into account people's race, people's economic situations. It just takes into account 
whether or not an American is disabled and provide the legal guarantee for people with disabilities. Oh, let's see here. Okay, advanced a little too soon. And something we always like to explain is that the ADA is descriptive rather than prescriptive. So it doesn't describe exactly, or I'm sorry, it doesn't prescribe exactly what to do in every single situation, but rather it describes what non-discrimination should look like. Everyone experiences disability differently. People could experience their disability differently pretend, depending on the day or the hour. So because of that, the ADA is broad in nature so that it does leave those room, that room for those case-by-case -case scenarios. That's why oftentimes if you were to contact us for TA or ask a question, we may start our answer with it depends because it largely depends on the circumstances, the situation, the individuals involved. And so in that way, the ADA is descriptive. Like I said, it describes what non-discrimination should look like rather than prescribing exactly what to do. So it's not one size fits all, which is actually a positive because that means it can be broadly applied to people with broad disabilities. So now let's look at who has rights under the ADA. To have rights under the ADA, you must be a person with a qualified disability or a qualified individual with a disability. So we're going to break down exactly what that means. But before I do that, does anyone have any questions so far? All right. Yeah, oh, yeah. we do have a question. Okay. Do you know if there are any efforts underway to include long COVID sufferers under the protection of the ADA? Absolutely, yes. So there's been a lot of um, publications in recent years pertaining to the ADA and COVID. And yes, um, people with long COVID would meet the definition of disability in many circumstances. So I'll go over that definition of disability, but long COVID can be considered a disability if it meets the criteria for disability under the ADA. And I would be happy to send um, more resources on that in the follow-up email for this because that's a really great question and it's been a topic of concentration for the ADA National Network and and um, just the ADA community in general. So that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. So the definition of disability under the ADA, which in many cases long COVID does meet, is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So the ADA also prohibits discrimination against those with a record of such an impairment and those regarded as having such an impairment. And I'll give examples of that later, but we call this a three-pronged definition because the ADA covers people with disabilities. It also covers people with a record of disabilities and those regarded as having disabilities. So let's break this definition down a little bit further. So an impairment per the ADA includes physical, intellectual, psychiatric, sensory impairments and many of disabilities are included in this definition. So physical could be things like diabetes, cosmetic disfigurement, anatomical loss, like the loss of a foot or an arm. Um, intellectual or cognitive could be dyslexia, autism, psychiatric may be depression, anxiety, sensory may be someone who is deaf or blind, and that is a very limited list. The list goes on and on and on of what disabilities include. Now, some things that are not included in the ADA are simple physical characteristics, normal deviations in height, weight, or strength, common personality traits. So at the ADA Center, we like to say being a jerk is not considered a disability under the ADA. It also doesn't include environmental, cultural, or economic disadvantages. So if you couldn't read because you didn't have access to education, that would not be considered a disability. However, if you couldn't read because you have dyslexia, that would be considered a disability under the ADA. And 
the ADA also does not include certain sexual behavior or behavioral disorders in the definition of disability. These including pedophilia, voyeurism, compulsive gambling, kleptomania, pyromania. Um, it also does not include um, psychoactive substance use disorders resulting from current illegal use of drugs. So, like I said, the definition of ADA or disability under the ADA is quite broad, but there are some things that are um, explicitly excluded in the definition. So what does it mean to be substantially limited? So in the ADA, substantially limited means that you are limited compared as compared to most people in the general population. But an impairment need not prevent or significantly or severely restrict the individual from performing a major life activity in order to be considered substantially limiting. Nonetheless, not every impairment will constitute a disability. So the comparison of an individual's performance of a major life activity to the performance of the same major life activity by most people in the general population usually doesn't require scientific, medical, or statistical analysis under the ADA, but rather it's more up to common sense and good faith analysis. And the determination of rather an, whether an impairment substantially limits a major life activity should be made without regard to the positive effects of mitigating measures. So if someone takes a medication that mitigates their disability, they are still considered someone with a disability. However, there is a exception to this, and that is eyeglasses. Um, eyeglasses are that one exception that are not or that should be considered when thinking of someone with a disability or assessing that situation. So although the ADA generally requires that the positive effects of mitigating measures like medication or assistive devices be ignored in assessing whether someone has a disability, the law requires that one does consider the positive effects of using ordinary eyeglasses or contact lenses. So you will find with the ADA there, there do come exceptions to the rule. Um, and if the use of ordinary lenses results in no substantial limitation to a major life activity, then the person's vision impairment does not constitute a disability under the first part of the ADA's definition of disability. So most of the time, you know, if you have a disability and you take medicine or any kind of measure to mitigate that disability, you're still considered someone with a disability unless that mitigating measure is eyeglasses. Yes, we have a question. What about hearing aids? Hearing aids, um, those would be something that uh, should not be considered when, when assessing if someone has a disability. So if you are someone who is deaf or hard of hearing and uses a hearing aid and that hearing aid um, substantially mitigates the limiting factors of your disability, you are still considered someone with a disability. So hearing aids are not one of those exceptions to the rules. Those would be one of those um, mitigating measures that wouldn't be regarded when determining if someone has a disability. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. So in short, um, if you are deaf and use a hearing aid, you are still considered someone with a disability. All right, any more questions if anyone, you know, needed to unmute or if they're, like I said, I'm, I'm not able to see the chat right now, but if there were any more in the chat, um, I want to leave some, some space for that. All right, well, we will go ahead and move on to that part of the definition that mentions a major life activity. So what are major life activities? A major life activity is something that most people in the general population can perform with little or no difficulty. So these include, but are definitely not limited to, working, speaking, breathing, doing manual tasks, walking, self-care, hearing, learning, the list goes on and on as you can see on the screen, but the list also goes on beyond those tasks that are, that are noted on the screen. And the ADA actually also considers major bodily functions as major life activities. So these include, but again, are not limited to your immune system, your digestive system, the bowel, the bladder, the neurological system, the brain, your respiratory system. 
as would be considered in cases of long COVID um, and reproductive functions. Those would all also be considered major life activities. So if you have a disability that impairs your bodily functions, you, you could meet the, the definition of disability under the ADA. And an impairment that substantially limits one major life activity does not need to limit other major life activities to be considered a substantially limiting impairment. So in other words, you could have an impairment that substantially limits just one major life activity. Let's say it's seeing, but it doesn't necessarily impair any other major life activities. You would still be considered someone with a disability in that case. We have another question. Yeah. So what about something like celiac disease? Does that uh, follow in, in this definition? Yeah, so again, that would um, involve that individual assessment of whether or not it substantially limits one or more major life activities. So again, a major life activity is something that most people um, in the general population can perform with little or mo more difficulty. And then those that substantially limiting is compared to most people in the general population. So let's say, you know, celiac disease uh, really substantially limited your digestive system as compared to most people in the general population, that could be considered a disability. All right, thank you. Oh, yeah. um, can you provide an example of something that would substantially limit self-care? Yeah, so um, some people may not be able to um, use the restroom. Um, Compared to most people in the general population, uh, they may have a mobility disability um, or like I said, you know, earlier when we were talking about um, loss of certain body parts that could uh, limit their ability to perform self-care. And so they may need the assistance of a service animal or a caregiver in that case. All right. Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right. Um, any more questions before we move on to, to the, the kind of the three-prong aspect of disability? Oh, we have a hand raised. Uh, go ahead, Christopher. Hi, Tess. Um, I wanted to speak out this question because it's kind of a little difficult to articulate the text. But so um, it seems that the ADA is defining disability in comparison to like an able-bodied person. Mm -hmm. And so, and maybe this will come up in your subsequent trainings, but how does one get around kind of like the ableist discourse where um, it's a comparison that is uh, in the paradigm of the ableist person when communicating with a person with a disability? So here we have a law that is uh, working for equal and fair treatment of everyone but it's using a comparison to what is considered a quote unquote able-bodied person. Mm -hmm. Then when you translate that into how um, a person communicates to a person that may have a variety of different or however uh, their disability is classified, how do you get around that paradigm of comparison to like the ableist paradigm? Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, I think that does make sense. Um, kind of, uh, we're using non-disabled people as the the standard. Is that is that kind of what you're asking? Could that be problematic? Yeah, I see it as problematic. But um, I'm wondering, uh, like, when when you get into discourse and communication with people with disabilities, it falls back on a law that's using able-bodied people as the standard. So how do you, in your work, work around that? And perhaps, as I said earlier, this is a part of your subsequent trip. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I could definitely confer with my colleagues on this and kind of see, you know, get more information and also include that in our follow-up as well. But um, personally, how I would answer this question is the ADA, like I mentioned earlier, is so broad in nature that it, um, it does, uh, it doesn't require scientific proof usually or uh, medical proof of a disability. And I think that there does need to be some standard just so that people are 
uh, able to be covered under the ADA because lots of people find a lot of empowerment in being able to identify themselves as disabled because it means that they do have these rights under the ADA. And so um, for, for, you know, I don't want to speak for all people in the disability community, but from different sources I've read, um, I've read that, you know, people want to be identified as disabled who are in the disabled community. They want to be um, recognized as different from someone who is non-disabled. And um, it well, we'll talk about this a little bit more in our disability etiquette training, but even um, people in the disability community community have strayed away from terms such as differently abled or special needs as to not create euphemisms for disability because those euphemisms can create some confusion within the ADA. So to answer your question, I would say that um, in order to have these rights, there does have to be a standard to compare against so that we do know when someone is being discriminated against, if that makes sense. Um, but I would say that the way that the ADA um, kind of combats that uh, the holding non-disabled people on, on um, you know, a higher level than disabled people is by not requiring any kind of proof when it comes to service animals. Usually there's no proof required when someone's trying to, um, you know, cite that, they're, that they have a disability. Uh, there are some cases where, where it may be necessary but um most of the time you know the ada like i said doesn't require that scientific proof it's more just um assessment and that's to to not make people with disabilities feel othered or feel um segregated from people with without disabilities i hope that answers your question yeah thank you and i, I do want to put it another way maybe mm -hmm. take us back and come back to the group uh but i was thinking that um, for public service, mm -hmm. how is the paradigm shift from the law that says it's comparison, uh, comparing someone with a disability to someone who's able-bodied to a day-to-day -day work situation and then also um, conversation and communication with um, a community of people with disabilities? How do you make that paradigm shift from comparing, like comparing against something to then working with. And so that's what my question is in a, in a different set, a different way. Don't need to answer it now. I just want to put that out there. So thank you. Yeah, of course. And yeah, um, something I would probably respond to that is when we're thinking about um, issues of accessibility, uh, there's, a, there's a concept called universal design, which looks at accessibility as something that can benefit everyone. So instead of comparing disabled people against non-disabled people, we could look at accessibility as something that could benefit the entire population, thus not drawing that line between those two communities. Right, co-benefits makes a lot of yes, sense. Yes, exactly. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and I'll also provide my contact information at the end of this training so that if you do have any follow-up, you can um, reach out. All right, so, uh, moving on with this uh, def the three prong definition. So the definition of disability also considers people who are regarded as having an impairment. So that could be a condition that's not substantially limiting, but is perceived as per substantially limiting. Um, or it could be only substantially limiting because of the attitudes of others. So an example of this could be someone who appears to have an impairment, but is not substantially limited by one let's say, you know, they have, they sustain burn scars from an incident, but they're no longer substantially limited. If they're treated as having a disability because they appear to have a disability, because they have these burn scars, they could be covered under the ADA. And then there's additional protections um, under the ADA. So one of these is an association protection. So the ADA prohibits employment discrimination against a person, whether or not he or she has a disability because of his or her known relationship or association 
with a person with a known disability. And this does not have to be a familial relationship, but if you are discriminated against because of your association with a person with a disability, you know, let's say that you are taking care of someone who has a disability and so you may need to adjust your work schedule and um, you are discriminated against, you would have protections under the ADA as well as someone who does meet that first definition of disability. Um, and then another additional protection. Yes, here. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll get to that in just one moment. Um, the ADA protects against retaliation for exercising your rights under the ADA. So um, if you are to file a complaint under the ADA and then your employer were to discriminate against you with, uh, because you filed that complaint, you, you could be covered. And yeah, what's that question? And you're muted, Patricia. Sorry. We're not hearing that. <laughs> that was interesting. I'd never known that part about the association. So just to clarify, so for example, let's say someone had caregiving duties for a parent who had dementia or a partner who had a major disability. Are, are, are employers required to allow that individual to adjust their work schedule, et cetera, uh, for that caregiving? Yeah, so in that case, they would have to go through um, the process of providing reasonable accommodation, which is an interactive process between an employer and um, a an employee in determining, you know, how you could accommodate someone with a disability or someone who has an association with a disability. So there would be a process in place to um, provide that reasonable accommodation to that you know that caregiver who may um, who may have to take care of someone who's disabled in order to not discriminate against them because of their association with someone with a disability. And we have another question. Maybe you've already covered. Mm -hmm. What about veterans who are disabled, or do they fall under another category? Um, would veterans who are disabled? Uh, fall under the category of disability under the ADA? I think so. Jeffrey, if you wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. Tell, yeah, yeah, that is, yes. So do we fall under the ADA or, or do we fall under federal laws? Because that's where we got our disability rating from, you know, whether it's well, through the VA, that's what I'm saying. So I guess my question is, yeah, do we fall under the ADA or would we go like a different route, I guess? Yeah, that's a good question. So there are different um, laws concerning disability on a federal level. Um, so those laws include the Rehabilitation Act, um, the Architectural Barriers Act. But if you're talking about a Title II entity, which is state and local governments, if you're talking about a Title III entity, which is public accommodation, so places like restaurants, retailers, um, then yeah, you, you would be considered someone with a disability under the ADA. So it kind of depends on what situation you're in, um, on which definition of disability you use, but someone who's substantially limited, you know, uh, by an impairment when doing one or more major life activities because of a, an impairment that they may have sustained um, when they were active duty or in the military and considered a disabled veteran would still be considered, you know, disabled under the ADA. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. So to put it short, you know, if you're dealing with um, entities that are covered under the ADA, so if you're discriminated against in employment, in a state or local government, um, in a public accommodation, then you would be considered disabled um, under the ADA's definition. All right, so we talked about how the ADA provides protection from discrimination, coercion, or retaliation if you're exercising your rights under the ADA. And then let's talk a little bit more about who has responsibilities under the ADA. So these actually, this actually might provide a little bit more clarity to those last two questions that were asked. Um, so the, the entities that are have responsibilities under the ADA are going to be Title I entities, so that covers employment, Title II entities that cover states and state and local governments, Title III entities, which are um, private entities or public accommodations, both for-profit and non-profit, 
Title four entities, which covers telecommunications, and then Title V um, is actually miscellaneous provisions under the ADA. So a little more on those. Um, Title I of the ADA covers all private employers with 15 or more employees, um, state and local governments, employment agencies, labor unions, and joint labor management committees. Title II covers all state and local governments and their departments, like, you know, the work you may be in. Um, agencies, special purpose districts, and other instrumentalities of state or local governments. Um, Title III specifies that no individual with a disability may be discriminated against or denied the full use of goods, services, facilities, privileges, or accommodations offered by a public accommodation. That might be, like I said, a restaurant, a hotel, a movie theater, a doctor's office, a retail store, a museum, a park, the list goes on and on and on for public accommodations. Um, Title IV requires that telephone companies provide telecommunication relay services that allow individuals with hearing or speech impairments to communicate using a teletypewriter or non-voice device. And Title IV also requires that all television public service announcements produced or funded in whole or in part by the federal government include closed captioning. So basically it's just providing accessibility in telecommunications. And then Title V is those miscellaneous provisions such as who enforces the ADA, um, different provisions under the different titles. It's miscellaneous, you know, it definitely holds that title. So there's there's lots of different things covered under that Title V, but Title I and Title II is kind of where we're going to stay for the remainder of this training because it is most applicable to your work. Um, That's a question. Where yeah. do K-12 and colleges and universities fall in that scheme? Yeah, so um, it, it depends on where they get their funding, um, but a university could fall under um, a public or the, the um, Title III of the ADA, um, but I could, again, provide more information on that um, and, and exactly how that works because it, it does kind of get a little bit nuanced depending on how the um, university is funded, if they're private or public. Um, so I'll include information on that. So um, I'll get back on long COVID and universities. Thank you. Yeah. So again, that like I said, that's where that it depends comes up very often in the ADA. So Title I of the ADA states that no covered entity should discriminate against a qualified individual on the basis of disability in regard to a job application procedures, the hiring, advancement, or discharge of employees, employee compensation, job training, and other terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. So Covered entities include private employers, state and local governments, employment agencies, labor unions, joint labor management committees, and persons who are agents of the employer, including managers, supervisors, foremen, background check agencies, et cetera. And these would be employers with 15 or more employees, including part-time employees. And then we talk about how they may not, um, Title I entities may not, discriminate against someone who is a qualified individual. So this kind of goes back to that question of, you know, would someone have to provide a reasonable accommodation for someone who is associated with someone? So let's say, you know, someone has to take care of a parent or a child who has a disability. Um, if the employee is a qualified individual with a disability, so the questions we ask there are, does the individual meet the necessary prerequisites? So education, work experience, training, skills, licenses, certificates, um, and can the individual perform the essential job functions with or without reasonable accommodations? then they would be considered a qualified individual under Title I of the ADA and um, would be entitled to reasonable accommodations. So the ADA is not an entitlement program. It's not affirmative action. People still do have to be qualified um, in that they do have to meet the education, work experience, training, skills, licenses, certificates, etc. of certain jobs in order to be hired. 
Um, an employer would not need to provide an accommodation to someone who's otherwise unqualified for a position. And quali qualifications must be based on fact and not speculation um, when it comes to the ADA. So any questions on that? All right. And then jumping ahead to um, Title II of the ADA, which may be of most interest to you, um, Title II applies to all state and local governments, their departments, and their agencies. And they pro it prohibits discrimination against qualified individuals with disabilities in all programs, activities, and services of public entities. So people with disabilities should not be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of services, programs, or activities. And um, Title II also establishes standards for the operations of public transit systems systems, including commuter and inner city rail like Amtrak. And talking a little bit more about um, those reasonable modifications. So a public entity must make a reasonable modification in policies, practices, or procedures to avoid discriminations. So it's important to note that um, there are some narrow exceptions to this. So um, a public entity, if they can demonstrate that the modifications would fundamentally alter the nature of its services, program, or activity, or cause an undue burden or direct threat, it may not be required to make those modifications. And an undue burden under the ADA is defined as um, something that would cause significant difficulty or expense if carried out. But like I said, these are narrow exceptions, and typically Title II entities are held to a pretty high standard when they do claim these exceptions. Um, that will be, you know, uh, looked at closely by the Department of Justice to determine if it would in fact be a fundamental alteration, undue burden, direct threat, or personal service, um, or if if um, if it meets any of those criteria, the fundamental alteration, undue burden, direct threat, they may not have to make those reasonable modifications. Um, public entities also are not responsible for providing personal devices or services to people with disabilities. So that would include like wheelchairs, prescription eyeglasses, hearing aids. Certainly entities could provide those things. You know, the, the ADA is kind of the bare minimum. So they could go above and beyond, but they're not required to as part of that reasonable modification policy. Any questions on that? All right. Okay, so moving through these last slides, um, a public uh, or a public entity should operate each service program or activity so that when it's viewed in its entirety, it's readily accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities. And public entities may not exclude from participation in or deny the benefits of the programs, activities, and services to people with disabilities because they're facilities are inaccessible. So in other words, if facilities are inaccessible, public entities should figure out ways to make them accessible rather than denying people with disabilities access. And ways to achieve that programmatic accessibility include um, acquisition or redesign of equipment, assignment of aids to beneficiaries, and provision of services at alternate accessible sites. So again, if a public entity is inaccessible, instead of turning someone with a disability away, they may figure out an alternate way to provide this program. So, you know, maybe let's move it to the first floor. Maybe let's move it to another site. Maybe let's assign an aid to a beneficiary so that they are able to access this program. In other words, it's not the responsibility of the person with the disability to figure out a way to access the program, but rather it's the responsibility of the public entity. And that also includes effective communication, which I'll just give a sneak peek on because that's going to be what our whole October 18th training is going to be focused on is effective communication. But what effective communication states is that people with disabilities that affect hearing, seeing, or speaking may use different ways to communicate. And a public entity must ensure that its communications with individuals with people with disabilities are as effective as communications with others. So that keyword is effective. So that may include providing alternative forms of communication or 
providing these auxiliary aids and services such as braille, assistive listening systems, video relay services, printed information, screen readers, or a qualified interpreter who is able to interpret effectively, impartially, and receptively and expressively using all necessary specialized vocabularies and is also able to maintain that confidentiality. And like I said, we'll talk a lot more about this um, on October 18th when we cover um, effective communication. And then there are also certain standards for facilities, which like I said, this slide will be um, will be included in the slides that I'll be sending out. But I want to make sure that we get to our um, final slide with all my contact information in case you did want to follow up and that I say that our next training, just as a reminder, will be on September 20th, which will cover disability etiquette and go into a lot more detail on how, um, you know, th those questions of how to treat people equitably but not create that division between the disabled community and the non-disabled community. And thank you again. I hope that this laid the groundwork for the ADA and our subsequent topics. Um, I want to make sure we don't go over time, but uh, here's my contact information if you'd like to reach out and follow up with me. Um, and I'll be sending out follow-up information as well to give a little more information on some of the questions we got today. But I want to thank you for being so attentive, for being here today. And and we, I so look forward to our next training on September 20th and um, to continuing this education. And so with that, I will go ahead and stop sharing. Um, but I can stick around for any questions that may be in the chat. Um, if you wanted to unmute yourself, raise your hand. Now I can see the chat. And I'm happy to stick around if anyone has any extra questions. But otherwise, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. I hope you all join me in a round of applause and a celebration. Thank you to Tess for joining us today. And Tess, we did have another question in the chat that I, I asked the person to hold till the end. So folks, this is your last chance to get some questions. Well, it's your last chance today. We'll have Tess back on September 18th, September 20th, sorry, as we talked about. So um, we did have another question in the chat. It was... How involved has the Rocky Mountain ADA Center been in legislation concerning voting rights restrictions and impacts on the disability community? Okay, yeah, let's see here. How involved has the Rocky Mountain ADA? Sorry, I'm just going to read this again to make sure I'm getting all of it. Um, so as far I, I'm not aware of our involvement um, as far as, you know, forming that legislation. However, we do provide education specifically pertaining to um, voting accessibility. We have an online training for accessible voting places. So it's definitely a topic that we've looked at and um, we've researched and we've actually published information on to remediate those um, difficulties that people with disabilities may face when it comes to voting, but I'm not aware of our involvement with any of that legislation directly. All right, thank you. Yeah, of course. Well, that was the last question I saw in the chat. So, I will thank you again. We've got lots of thank yous pouring in the chat. So thank you, thank you. Thank you to all of you who joined us today and learned a lot more. I know I learned a lot more from Tess. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all again in September and then in October as we continue to dive in. With that, I'm going to stop the recording so that we can make this available for folks later on. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you all. <laughs>